So years ago, I was visiting a friend at the Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C., and he invited me to go to where he was living and have dinner with him. It was sort of an interesting uh, place, a neat experience, because he was living in a small house with other divinity students that had been converted into a monastery. Now, the abbot of the monastery was a older, sort of plump man with white hair and a big white beard. He sort of looked like Santa Claus. And uh, we came together and we had dinner. It was really a uh, pleasant time. We ate salad and pasta. We talked mostly about theology. I was the lone Presbyterian in a room full of Catholics. We had a lot of good um, laughs and discussion, and, and it was a pleasant experience. And after a while, the abbot retired to his room. An abbot, he's the, the head of the monastery, and, and he retired to his room, and we continued the discussion until about 10 or 11 o'clock at night, just a, a really sweet time. And I wanted to say goodbye to the abbot because he had been so hospitable. And so my friend walked me up to his room where he was watching TV in a, in a big, sort of comfortable recliner, and we shook hands, and then the abbot looked me straight in the eye and said, give me a blessing. Now, I was caught off guard. I had never done anything like that before. Unsure of what to do, I put my hand on his shoulder and prayed something like, Lord, thank you for Mr. So-and-so. Uh, for his hospitality and for his kindness. Please, Lord, give him a blessing. Amen. And the abbot looked at me like, that was kind of a weak blessing. (laughs) And he rose from his chair, the recliner that he was in, and he grabbed my head with both of his hands, his big sort of abbot hands, and he said... The blessing of the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, together with all the saints and all the angels and the Virgin Mary. And when he said the Virgin Mary, he kind of shook my head as if to say, take that, you Protestant, and the Virgin Mary be with you forever. Amen. I didn't know if I had been blessed or cursed. (laughs) It was sort of a blessing with a little bit of a jab mixed in. We laughed, and I went on my way after the experience. So this morning, I want you to imagine that the author to the Hebrews rises from his teaching chair after 13 chapters of instruction, of theology, the, the, the doctrine that we've been hearing now over several weeks, and that he grabs you by the head and begins to shake your head and says to you this blessing, may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. We talk about a blessing, right? That's a blessing. The formal word for this kind of a blessing is a benediction. And what we see when we look at this uh, text a little bit more closely, that what this benediction or this blessing does, it takes the theology that we've been going over for the first 13 chapters of the book of Hebrews, and it prays it into the people. It's almost as if this pastor is saying, get this into your head, get this into your heart. And isn't that more than anything what we need today to know the doctrine, the theology, the grammar of the faith, the truth of God's word with our minds, the the grammar of theology, and then to have those truths sink down deep inside of our hearts so that we begin to live by them and experience the love and the joy and the peace that comes through knowing God and how he has revealed himself to us in his word to know what he has done for each of us. And that's precisely what this word of blessing, this benediction focuses on here at the very end of the book of Hebrews. What God has done 
for you and what God is presently doing in you. I want you to think about that for a second. Like, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, united to Christ, it isn't just that God did something for you a long time, a long time ago. It's that God right now is doing something in you. He's still working. And so what this benediction, what this blessing does, is it takes all of the theology we've been going over over the last 27 weeks. That's how long we've been in the book of Hebrews. This is week number 28, and this is the final week that we're going to be here in the book of Hebrews. It takes all of the theology, and it wraps it up, and it prays it into the people. Now, where are we going to next? Just to give you a heads up, um, I'm excited to announce that next week we're going to start a series or a study through the Lord's prayer. And so we're going to be there for a while. If you're a Christian, you've ever said, man, I wish I prayed more, or I just kind of struggle with prayer sometimes, which is everyone, I think, in this room, um, then you'll want to make sure that you give careful attention to the Lord's Prayer. And what we're going to be looking at for for several weeks as we study that, and that should lead us into the season of Advent nicely, um, and we'll sort of redirect our attention and, and focus on the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But today we're looking at this final blessing, this benediction in the book of Hebrews. And if you're familiar with the Bible, you know that these blessings are all over the place, right? Like these kinds of blessings, these benedictions, you see them in the Old Testament, you see them in the New Testament. The really important thing to to say about these blessings is that they're not just a formality. This isn't just a, a, a... empty set of words phrases that are strung together that don't mean anything in scripture the spoken blessing or the benediction functioned like a gift that was given that couldn't be taken back it was it was something objective it was like if i handed you money or a present right like that's that's yours now it doesn't belong to anyone else it belongs to you there's a really amazing story in the very first book of the bible that some of you might be familiar with where a father isaac gives a particular blessing to one of his sons do you remember what the name of the son who got the blessing was Jacob, you were the only one who raised your hand, so that's very good, Henry. Um, Jacob, right? And the, the blessing should have gone to Esau, his older brother, but what did Jacob do? Jacob dressed up like his older brother. He came to his father. He sort of deceptively pretended like he was his older brother, and his father, Isaac, gave him the blessing. And then later, when his older brother came to receive the blessing from his dad, you remember what Isaac said to him in Genesis 27, verse 35. He says, your brother came deceitfully, and he has taken away your blessing. You think about that. Well, this idea of the benediction, this, this spoken blessing, it was this gift that was objectively given. Isaac couldn't say, oh, sure, I'll just, I'll just say these same words over you. No, he had given Jacob the blessing, now Esau could not have it. I was listening to a man the other day who was explaining how he had his first and only baby at the age of 52. After years and years of trying and waiting, his wife uh, got pregnant and they finally had a baby. And he said that when, when it happened, when he was in the hospital, he was just absolutely overwhelmed with emotion. Can you imagine? The baby was placed in a nursery with other small babies and he went in he said and i just gazed at my daughter the first thought i had is wow she she looks just like my mom when my mom was this age he grabbed onto his daughter's foot he said and the tears began to stream down my face as i prayed for her and i prayed that God would be with her. I was praying, he said, for her future, that God would fill her with a sense of his presence, that in God she would find not only her Lord, but a friend that she could go to in difficult times. And he said, as I was holding my daughter's foot and crying and praying this blessing, a nurse came up to me. She put her arm on my shoulders. He said, and she said, sir, Excuse me, that's not your baby. (laughs) We all um, laughed at the story, and he teased that somewhere there's a Filipino boy walking around who's immensely blessed 
it sort of illustrates, right, like this idea of the blessing. Like you don't want to say it to the wrong person. This is a gift that's given that can't be taken back. And again, I want you to think about this because we often you know, think about you know, when we greet people with, with words or when we say goodbye to them, you know, it's sort of like an empty formality. Hey, how's it going? God bless you. See you later. That's, that's not how these benedictions functioned in the Bible. This isn't a flowery, flowery way of saying goodbye. This is the blessing of God being placed upon the people of God. And that's what God wants to do for us every time we gather together for worship. God is placing in an objective way his blessing, his grace, his gospel on you. That's why a part of our service every week is the benediction, where we hear from Numbers chapter 6, the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you. This is God's gift to you. He wants us to be refreshed in Jesus every time we come here. And the very first thing we got to say about this text is is this passage uh, is introduced to us is who is the God who is being referred to here? And he's talked about as the God of peace. That's what verse 20 says. He's identified as the God of peace. And this is sort of curious. In the Old Testament, God is designated as all sorts of different things, but never is he really referred to with this title as the God of peace. He's the God of our fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of heaven and earth, right? You might uh, remember some of those ways of referring to God. But, uh, describing him as a, the God of peace, this seems like something different, like something new. Why peace? There are a lot of words that the author to the Hebrews could have used here, right? He could have said the God of grace the God of righteousness, the God of justice, or thinking about the book of Hebrews as we've been studying it now for for a few months, he could have said the God of holiness, right? That's something, a theme that we've seen in the book of Hebrews over and over and over again as we've been studying it, that God is the God of holiness, but he doesn't say the God of holiness. He says the God of peace. When we think about this title for God, together with some of the other ideas in this benediction, some of the other words and phrases that we hear, the idea of God's everlasting love, the idea of God's covenant, it seems like this pastor who's writing to the Hebrew Christians is meditating on another passage in the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 54, verse 7. Let's just turn there so we can look at this text really quickly together. It, It was read for the Old Testament reading, but I want to look at it here Isaiah 54 beginning in verse 7 God says for a brief moment I deserted you but with great compassion I will gather you in overflowing anger for a moment I hid my face from you but with everlasting love I will have compassion on you says the Lord, your Redeemer. This is like the days of Noah to me, as I swore that the waters of Noah should no more go over the earth, so I have sworn that I will not be angry with you and will not rebuke you. For the mountains may depart and the hills be removed, but my steadfast love shall not depart from you, and my covenant of peace shall not be removed, says the Lord, who has compassion on you. You think about it, you read that text, and it almost sounds like the lyrics to a love song, God says, my love for you is going to be here longer than the mountains. You ever looked at a mountain range or gazed at a really big mountain and just been blown away by its immensity? You know, you feel small and insignificant standing in the shadow of the great big mountain. The mountains were there long before you were, long before I was here. They're going to be there long after we're dead and, and here Isaiah says, the love of God for his people outlasts the mountains. Who is the God of peace? The God of peace is the God whose love for his people is unshakable. The psalmist said, your steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds, your righteousness is like the mighty mountains of God. If you were to talk to God and ask God, How much do you love your people? 
God could say to you, I love my people to the moon. My love for them extends to the heavens, beyond the stars. And if you were to say to him, God, well, how, how firm is that love? He would say, well, well, my love for my people is like the mighty mountains. It's as stable as Mount Everest. You can't shake the love that I have for my covenant people. If you were to say, well, that's great. So, so you love them to the moon and it, it's a stable love, but how long does it last for? God would say, well, let me tell you, my love for my people is everlasting. It doesn't end. It's not here for a moment and then gone tomorrow. My love is everlasting. I am the God of peace. He's the God of peace. And he's more than that. He's the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus. That's how, again, this benediction begins. Now, does that language sound a little bit odd to you, maybe weird? You know, Jesus was brought up from the dead. We can also translate this verse as Jesus was led out of the dead. Sort of not the way we typically talk about the resurrection of Jesus. We might expect the author to the Hebrews to say that Jesus was raised from the dead. But that's the word that we typically use. Why does he say that Jesus was brought up or led out of the dead? And, and what's interesting is when you look at scriptures like this, you know, when there's kind of an interesting phrase that's used, it's almost never insignificant. And it seems like here what the author is trying to do is echo another Old Testament passage from the book of Isaiah. So you still have uh, at least your, your Bible open to Isaiah. You can turn to Isaiah chapter 63, look at verse 9. Thinking about this language of being brought again from the dead, our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep. Listen to Isaiah 63, beginning in verse 9. It says, In all their affliction, speaking of the affliction of the people of God, he was afflicted, and the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his pity, he redeemed them. He lifted them up and carried them all the days of old, but they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. Therefore, he turned to be their enemy. And himself fought against them. And he remembered the days of old of Moses and his people. Where is he who brought them up out of the sea with the shepherds of his flock? Where is he who put in the midst of them his Holy Spirit? You know the comparison that's being made here, and it makes sense, right, if you've been with us as we've been studying the book of Hebrews. In the Old Testament, God led his people, brought his people out of Egypt through the Red Sea by the hand of Moses, their shepherd. God delivered them out of the sea. He brought them out of the sea. Here the author to the Hebrews says, Jesus, he's not just another shepherd. Jesus is the great shepherd who wasn't brought out of the sea, but brought out of the realm of the dead. And Jesus, the great shepherd, delivers his people from that slavery. Slavery to sin and slavery to death. This is actually what the author of the Hebrews was referring to a lot earlier in the book of Hebrews, back in chapter 2, verses 14 and 15, where he said, Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, Jesus himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. And typically when I read the law, you know, I, I'll just go through most of the time the, the Ten Commandments and I'll start with the preface to the Ten Commandments where God identifies himself to his people. He says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out. There's that language again of being brought out. I brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. And you think, well, that doesn't really fit for us, right? Like we weren't delivered out of Egypt, we, the people today of God, the new covenant people of God, we were not brought out of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, but the author of the Hebrews would say to us, no, we were brought out of a slavery that was far worse. God brought us out of the pit of death through his son, 
Jesus Christ. And that's what the author of the Hebrews is doing here with this language, is he's showing us that Jesus is the great shepherd of the sheep, greater than Moses. He's calling the Hebrew Christians and us to fix our gaze upon Jesus, the great shepherd, so that we would have a sense of how much God has saved us, delivered us, rescued us. Have you ever been rescued out of a scary situation? When I was, uh, before I was a Christian, I'll add this, but when I was about 13, I thought it would be a good idea to go with my cousins to see some illegal drag races in Mexico. And we arrived at the secret destination where the races would be held, and shortly after we arrived, the police arrived as well. And we fled, which is not what you want to do in Mexico, um, flee from the police. But we fled in an old Ford Explorer. And we didn't get far before we were pulled over. I was terrified. These weren't regular police, although I don't know that that would have made much of a difference in Mexico. But they were dressed in all black. They carried big rifles. They drove around in un- unmarked vehicles. And we were told that we had to get out of the car. And they handcuffed us all together. And they threw us in the back of one of their unmarked vans. Needless to say, I was uh, shaking in my tennis shoes, and the guy driving the Explorer that we were in, he was only 17 years old, he said, someone needs to give them money so that they will let us go. And my cousins, who were all there, they lived in Mexico, they didn't seem to be phased by this at all. They were taking the money out of their wallets and hiding it in their socks. And uh, I was terrified on the verge of tears and totally afraid in the back of the van. I said to my cousins, give them everything. (laughs) And to this day, when I see my cousins, they greet me by laughing and saying, give them everything. That's... (laughs) pretty terrible. In the end, I was the only one who gave the police anything, uh, $40 out of my wallet, and they let us go. I ransomed us out of the dungeon of a Tijuana jail. And you don't know how good it felt that night to lay down in my bed knowing that I had been rescued from the pit, resting peacefully that night. Well, brothers and sisters, tonight when you lay down in your bed, you can have a great sense of God's deliverance, of peace, of salvation, because the Bible teaches that humanity outside of Christ is in the pit, the dungeon of slavery to sin and death. And you can give everything that you have, all of your good works, all of your money, all of your time, and it wouldn't be enough to pay to get you out of the hole. Jesus is the good shepherd who leads his people out of the realm of death through what? Our good works? No. Our generous tithes and offerings? Certainly not. We're told that he was brought again from the dead through the blood of the eternal covenant. And again, if you've been with us here as we've been studying the book of Hebrews, you know that he's he's referring to the blood of the new covenant, the blood of Jesus, greater than the blood of bulls and goats that once for all cleanses us of all of our sins so that we can have peace with the God of peace. So that we can lay down tonight in our beds and rest knowing that through the blood of the eternal covenant, we've been delivered out of the deepest and darkest pit that now instead of being enslaved in Jesus, you and I are free. And it's not just that God has done this for us in time, in history, sent his son to accomplish these things. As he goes on, the, the author of the Hebrew says, God is actually still doing something in you, his people. He says in verse 21, he wants to equip you with everything good that you may do his will, and that he is working in you that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. You just think about the immensity of this blessing here that is spoken over the, author, or over the people by the author to the Hebrews. God sent his son so that you might be cleansed of your sins. God, right now, is working in you that which is pleasing in his sight. Isn't that an encouraging word for this pastor to end on? I don't know 
about you, but at least for me sometimes, you can look at your life and you can think, I'm really not where I'd like to be. Not where I want to be right now. Not in terms of, you know, I'd like to be somewhere else other than here, but just in my own life, in my own sanctification, in my own growth in grace, there are still so many areas of growth where we could do a better job loving each other, loving our family, loving God, trusting God's promises. And sometimes you think about it, you look at your life and you feel absolutely overwhelmed thinking, how is it possible that I can ever go from here where I'm at to holy where God calls me to be? And what we've been seeing in the book of Hebrews, the great promise to us in the gospel is that through the blood of Jesus Christ, we have been made holy. We have been sanctified, set apart by God for his purposes. And not only has he made us holy in one sense, positionally in his son Jesus, but he's also making us holy day by day. That God, brothers and sisters, is working in you that which is pleasing in his sight. The same God who sent his son, Jesus, to shed his blood for you, sent his Holy Spirit so that day by day you could be sanctified and made more and more, and more into the image of Jesus. And that's, that's what this spoken blessing communicated to the people then, and that's what it communicates to us today as God's people now. So brothers and sisters, as we conclude our study in the book of Hebrews, let's take that blessing, the knowledge of what God has done for us, and the knowledge of what God is doing in us, working by his spirit to make us more and more into the image of his son Jesus, to make us what we already are in Christ, holy. Let's let it sink into our hearts, into our heads and into our hearts, so that we can Do that which is pleasing to him. Amen? Let's pray.